Hello, everyone, and welcome to this roundtable. My name is Maria, the head of retail at Retail's uh, Avoiders Events. And I will be the moderator today, and I'm really, really happy and excited to be joined today by these four, five amazing professionals today um, with a combined, what did we say, 100 years of experience, a century of experience, basically. Um, there's, there's, a, there's a juicy topic of supply chain continuity and um, that data-driven decision-making. And, and I'll begin with a short introduction from the amazing panelists, and then we'll dive right into the topic and we'll get our teeth into it. Um, you know, everyone relax, grab your tea, coffee, biscuits, whatever you like, um, <laughs> and then we'll get straight into it. Um, just remember everyone, you can ask questions um, in the chat um, and then we'll try to allocate some time to answer them as well. Um, so all that being said, I'll start with some short introductions from everyone and I'll take it in the order of, of the screen and I'll start with Prabhu. Um, so Prabhu, if you could quickly introduce yourself. Oh, thank you, Maria. Um, my name is Prabhu um, uh, I'm, I'm I work for Advanced Auto Parts uh, as the uh, Enterprise Data Analytics Lead. Uh, focus heavily on the platform technology side, but also working with the business lines of business and supply chain is one of them. And um, definitely a lot of uh, interest and um, knowledge when I can share and interest to learn more from uh, the panelists as well as the questions that might come from the audience today. Perfect, thank you. Uh, and next up is Brian. I am uh, Brian Hecht, uh, supply chain strategist for Kroger uh, here in the US. And my responsibility is to help make sure that we're getting the information we need to make sure that the supply chain runs smoothly. Wonderful. And Luca, if you'd like to go next. Hello, guys. Good morning. Uh, Luca Soriano, uh, Vice President of Sourcing for Under Armour. Uh, my portion of the one fifth of the 100 years uh, I've been spending that time in the factories <laughs> when uh, sourcing was majority uh, facing vendor, facing the back end of supply chain. And I think that the interesting thing now is it's shifting towards more of a front end supply chain. So I'm really excited to be here with you and share a few, few things I've learned so far. Amazing. And we have Nick joining us as well. Hi, Maria. Yeah, thanks. My name is Nick Hunt. Um, I'm Enterprise Account Director for Trade Shift here in the UK. I look after retail and CPG, so I spend all my days chatting to retail and CPG companies, understanding the issues, and trying to solve some of those issues for them. So uh, really happy to be speaking to you today. Wonderful. And last but not least, Bill. Hey, good morning, everybody. Um, I guess good afternoon and good evening as well. Um, I am um, Bill Mines and I look after finance as well as data and analytics for Walmart's US supply chain organization. Uh, been down here in Bentonville, Arkansas with Walmart for six years. And prior to that, I had different uh, supply chain um, and finance roles for a number of different organizations, um, Diageo, uh, prior to that, Pepsi, and before that, Cargill. Uh, looking forward to the conversation. I don't think there's any better time to talk about data uh, than there is right now. Um, you know, we've been through nearly 12 months of pandemic, and in, certainly in retail, we've seen a big shift towards um, <clears throat> and focus on uh, the importance of an omnichannel organization. And having the right data in the right place at the right time is, is absolutely paramount now in our business and making sure that we've got the accessibility and the, the accuracy that we need uh, is just hugely important. So looking forward to the conversation. Brilliant. Um, so like you mentioned, Bill, so the discussion today is, is basically about supply chain continuity in relation to data and how we use that data. And we know data is, is everything now in supply chain, especially when you want a visible, agile, and proactive supply chain. Um, but then the finer points around data collection, integration, collaboration still need a, a, a little bit of refinement when it comes to supply chain. Um, so I think as a question to start off uh, to all of you, but then Bill, if you can answer first, um, what are some of the key elements, uh, key kind of challenges that you foresee in relation to data for, to supply chain in the coming months and then possibly years as well? 
Yeah, so um, I think uh, I think a few things spring to mind. Um, number one is you know you've got to have strong foundations. Okay, uh, you've got to build the house on uh, a solid uh, platform. So you know governance for me is extremely important. Um, you know, particularly in retail, and, and uh, I don't think Walmart's unique in this. We've come from an environment where you've got a lot of different platforms generating a huge amount of data. And, you know, one of the challenges where you've got lots of different legacy systems is making sure that, um, you know, number one, you've got one version of the truth. So that when you're having a conversation around data or you're presenting data or you're referring to it, leveraging it, whatever, um, you've got confidence that it's coming from, you know, one source, it's been validated, um, and the definitions of the data are properly governed, uh, so that when folks in different parts of the organization are accessing the data, and for us in Walmart these days, you know, that means accessing it from the cloud largely, um, They've got confidence that, you know, it's one version, it, it's been validated, it's been governed, and they can rely on it, and they can access it easily. Um, I think the other thing that I point to is speed. So, you know, you think about what's happened over the last 12 months, and the shift towards, uh, or an accelerating shift towards customers wanting to be able to shop online or pick up from store for us, then you know, you're no longer in a world where um, you can think about data and uh, rely on things or, or, or that you can take hours uh, to get hold of data. It's gotta be accessible within minutes uh, and real time, even in seconds. Because we're living in a world where you know customers want uh, to be able to shop online, get stuff delivered in hours, um, or even you know one to two days. So having that data accessible and being able to access it uh, quickly, reliably, at speed, so that you can make decisions about how am I going to get something delivered to somebody's home or enable them to pick it up in store in a very very rapid manner is becoming increasingly important. Great, so you mentioned a few key things here. So speed, real time, um, visibility, um, accessibility, getting those foundations done. I think my next question is, um, I think those are the main challenges. The next question is, um, how do we <laughs> exactly achieve all those things? And um, these are usual kind of supply chain supply chain buzzwords, but how exactly do we get to, to that real-time visibility? Um, are we even there yet? What, what are the elements that, that can get us to have a more speedy kind of um, data accessibility and, and making sure we, we get the data when we need it and in the form we need it in? Um, and this is, this is for all of you. I think probably Brian, I'm relying on you maybe to kind of provide the technicals on this one as well. So from my perspective, being able to get the data in real time it is a challenge. And I want to agree and reinforce what Bill said. You know, we have a lot of legacy systems as well. And that master authoritative source is definitely a concern. Um, there is a cost of getting that data that we have not had to deal with, I don't think, as an industry. Um, it's easier for us to use labor in many cases. But as things get tighter, we need to inch, get data in in a speed that matters as efficiently and cost effectively as possible. And I think as an industry, we're still kind of in that emerging space where we see where it's going to go, but we're not quite haven't been able to quite implement it yet across the board. Uh, probably, Bill, would you agree with that? Certainly. I'll take it on from there. Thank you, Brian. That definitely um, resonate with a lot of what Brian said. Uh, I do want to add that, I mean, like, I mean, this retail industry has been um, much like what Bill and Brian said was they've been in the legacy world for quite some time. Some of them have actually 
started moving the needle over the last few years. Um, though I don't work for them, I could exempt. So Walmart is probably the biggest example in that sense who actually embarked on the journey much before everyone else. Take Amazon out of the equation, but uh, because that started as an IT company, but if you start Walmart, that they were kind of the evangelists in the sense. I think a lot of them are trying to mimic or follow the lead of Walmart Labs in that sense to provide that capability. You don't have the same problem at the scale that you have to do for Walmart, but the thing, the net net, there are issues with the legacy systems. Are they capable of doing real time? What do you need to do to patch, bridge that gap to real time? So that, that will be technical debt, if I can use that term, along the way when you actually re-platform those systems to the newer world. So we have to take those calculated investments and risks, so to say, to get people moving along the direction and get the mindset shifted to a real time. And then the technology can, um, <clears throat> once you, you don't need to take the rug as a whole, start doing things underneath. And when you take it off, the, the, take the covers off, everything seems seamless at that point. That should be a journey. The second part is what Bill mentioned over the data governance. Quality is a big issue in the legacy systems. Um, there is a lot of manual touch points, people keying in data, point of sale systems having a variety of issues, the distribution centers having issues. People have their own interpretation of how things have sprung up in the tribal world, if I want to call that. Uh, and so collating all this stuff and bringing that central master data for a product inventory, uh, products uh, master or a customer master or anything else is very important. And that is goes hand in hand. It cannot, one cannot go before the other. So it, these need to happen so that systems start adopting the master data while they start slowly un unwinding from the old legacy way of entering manually entering information. So it is a journey and it's not a few months journey. It's a multi-year journey and every organization is going through it. Um, uh, the example I've always heard is Best Buy, for example, has a real-time dashboard of their sales on the CEO's dashboard. I don't know if it's true, but I've heard this. Uh, but that's a nirvana state. Everyone wants to get there, but you also need to figure out it's really worth for you, your own organization and own industry. Um, that's that's the lead up to it. Hopefully I, ha I answer that question. No, definitely. Is there something that um, Bill, Luca, Nick, you'd like to add to this? Um... Yeah, uh, I will chime in here. Um, it's very interesting to to look at data and uh, to think about quality of data, and, uh, and and structure and governance. And I feel that when we do that, we are in the um, the day. We are back in the days before COVID. And uh, I I actually discovered that uh, in the old days. Uh, decision were based on signal that we used to receive and the deliver of those signal were data, absolutely. And then we can talk about uh, uh, signal stability and of course governance and quality were the one, the two lever that we used to have to improve those signal. But I would say that with COVID, we actually discovered that uh, the, the, the data quality is not the only issue we have. We have the ambiguity of the signal that comes from the outside world. And I would say that today, on top of that, used to be the one problem of, I don't know, let's call it a 10% uh, deviation. One time it's bullwhip, one time it's uh, data quality. But I think today, on top of that 10%, actually there is a greater uh, concern for all of us and it's the ambiguity of information. And uh, and it's almost feels that we are at the, at the, the turning point that we have to make a decision. Are we gonna invest in having better systems or are we investing to have better processes? Because I think that uh, with increasing the flexibilities on, on processes, it actually can overcome the fact that we have bad data. And, uh, and I think that you know we tend to focus on the technology part because it, this used to be uh, everybody's enemy from the old days. But I think today uh, we have probably are better off start looking a little bit more holistic end to end and think of instead of focusing only on 
technology, let's focus on shortening that end to end so that we can make that journey faster and then probably bring back technology, which by the way, I do agree that we are sitting on some very legacy and obsolete uh, platform. So it, it probably, it's a really fascinating, the post COVID, it's gonna be a transformation for the entire industry, I believe. So one thing I just wanna bring up as an escape technologist, that technology can't fix process on its own. Um, technology can be used to augment process and to refine it and, and to help get good data at the appropriate points within the process. But the business has to understand what the process is and make sure the process is as efficient and flexible as possible. So I just, uh, I just saw an interesting question on the chat room um which was uh as you go on this journey have you got the right people and uh i think it's a great question because you know it does underscore the fact that it's not just about technology you know yeah i agree process is important as well and all those things but at the end of the day you know if you if you get it all right and i think you know lots of organizations are really uh but almost at that intersection of starting to to see a lot of this come right um then the question then becomes okay have we got the people to leverage it and have we got the right skill sets the right training you know and i think one of the things that we've seen and are very cognizant of is if you're going from a world where you know uh um we we rely on um enterprise systems and doing a lot of uh sort of spreadsheet work in excel to one where you know you've got cloud-based data uh, you've got way more sophisticated tools uh that enable you to access a lot more data a lot more rapidly then have you actually got the people that uh, are going to be able to do that so i think there's <clears throat> you know there's another component of this around making sure that uh, the people that you've got in the organization, you're taking them on that journey with you, uh, providing the right training and the right change management there. I just want to add on to what Bill said, right? In the organizations that you, you're inheriting or you're part of, there are a set of process experts and there are a set of people who are technology experts are inclined to learning the new technology or people. There could be some process experts who've been doing some technology stuff, but they're more capability and who know in and out of how the system works, not the technology company, but how the process works and how these things come together. They have to focus and continue to be delivering the subject matter expertise in that area. Um, and somebody has asked the question, how do you bring, I mean, do you expand? So, on getting partners or anyone? Yes, absolutely. In this journey, you want to get some SIs, if you think of the right technology, you want to bring the SIs that system integrators who actually do that for you, they can do the phishing for you originally. But now if you go back to the earlier point I mentioned about splitting the technology experts and the process experts, you want the technology experts to be learning how to fish along with these system integrators. And then at some point, they step away, you become, you learn, you start fishing yourself. That is the journey that you got to take your organization through. It is not about people losing jobs or people, hey, we, what do we do with, we do? that is, we got to build the psyche around what everyone's input and value add to the organization as they move forward to the new, next gen. I absolutely agree. We, we are problem solvers. Uh, on the technology side, on the business side, it doesn't matter. We, our job is to understand problems and solve them. And when you solve problems, you do a good job, you get new problems to solve. You should be constantly working yourself out of the tasks that you're in currently. Um, I, if anybody hasn't seen The Martian, go watch it. It was developed, it was written, Andy Weir, um, is a technology architect from what I've read. And you can tell it's, you figure out the problem, what's the problem you're trying to solve and you solve it and then you move on to the next problem. And once you've solved enough problems, uh, you get to go home. So, you know, it, it's a great movie. Everybody should see it if they haven't. Yeah, you're right, Brian, it's a great film. 
Uh, you know, one of the things I see um, in, in trade shift when I go out and speak to retailers is, um, I think Bill, you said this the other day that we have so much data, right? It's like, what is the important data that we have in the organization? And, you know, and is that data accurate as well? So one of the things we, we do in trade shift when, when we're speaking to organizations is we talk about data actually coming from source. So, so when you're collaborating, for example, with your suppliers, you know, why are you updating that information in your ERP system? Why aren't you getting the suppliers to be providing that information because they, they know it best? And, and the critical things now is really about that collaboration across the supply chain. So not just viewing a retailer on, on your own, but, but looking and, and trying to protect and work with that supply chain. And, you know, only in that way are, are you actually going to get the best results. And, and certainly through COVID, I, I think that the retail supply chains uh, have been under an enormous amount of pressure. I mean, here in the UK, we we still have a lot of retail organizations that are closed because of COVID. And, you know, that affects the whole supply chain. So, so being able to have the right data, being able to collaborate across that supply chain is really, really important at this moment in time. And, and I wonder what you guys think of that. Luca, <laughs> I'll put it over to you. Uh, tough question. Uh, I, I think uh, you know we are at the turning point, uh, and uh, and I, I believe it's uh, it's very important to to have a significant alignment with the, the one running um, the strategy first. And uh, once that alignment happens, uh, we are able to better understand uh, how to cascade, uh, and especially when it comes to speed. I believe that. That is the clarity because when we run projects, uh, I believe that projects most of the times have got conflicting um, priorities and uh, the alignment on priorities, the alignment on timelines and the alignment on the speed to execute, uh, I think it's uh, they're extremely uh, important. So I would definitely uh, look after for very, very high level direction to start with before uh, entering a journey of change management. So we've, we've got quite a few questions coming in um, and Bill has already answered uh, one of them. So I think I'll pick another one because these there's loads of them and they're all, they're all quite good. Um, so let's see, which one should I pick? Um, so let's see, what are the examples of impact you have seen with the ability to see your supply chain from end to end or the lack thereof? Well, let me let me um, pick up on uh, something that Luca said, which is you know from a from a retailer perspective, obviously you've got a lot of stakeholders. I mean, you know, one is uh, obviously we've got customers, and the the interesting perspective there is you know not just coming out of COVID, but I think over a period of years now, you're starting to see that the customer has access to more and more information to make their decisions on. You know, pretty much everybody's got a, 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 a smartphone, iPhone or whatever. And, you know, you, you, can, you can see that people are using that to access information that's available publicly. Um, to make decisions about where they shop, how they shop, <laughs> um, you know, what prices are out there. So they can pretty much instantaneously compare um, prices across lots and lots of different retailers, whether it's, you know, in store, online, um, however they want to shop. And so, you know, one of the challenges that we've got is we've got to be prepared for that and cognizant of that and recognize that we're here to service the customer and make, make the customer's lives easy. And customers, you know, generally uh, want to uh, shop with everyday low prices. So, you know, one of our missions at Walmart is to, to 
service the customer, make lives easier and do it at everyday low prices. And then you think back up the supply chain, you know, to do that, <laughs> we've got to get to a world where we're sharing more and more data with our upstream stakeholders, whether it's vendors or, you know, other uh, interested stakeholders in the supply chain. And then you get into, okay, well, what are you going to share? How are you going to share it? <laughs> um, what's the sort of medium? How, how regularly are you going to share it? And uh, how are you going to make it available to vendors to meet their specific needs in a, in a secure manner? And, you know, I think that the last point around security is clearly something that becomes more and more important. I was, I was kind of reflecting this morning on that story that came out in the last couple of days around uh, a hacker that tried to pollute you know, a town's water supply in Florida. And you think, well, that's, you know, one, that's absolutely terrible. Uh, but two, you know, there are um, people and organizations out there that are constantly trying to think up ways of, <laughs> of doing things like that. And uh, so, you know, you've got to be one step ahead of the game here and thinking through, you know, if I do want to share information and that involves making information and data available to people how am i going to do that in a manner that's secure and protects you know my data my customers data and uh, the organization's data so i think as you as data becomes more widely available uh the 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 sort of security aspect and the aspect of how we're going to stay one step ahead of people that purport to abuse that uh, becomes more important as well. Absolutely. I, I Just to pick up on that, Bill, I, I think that is really, really important because if you look at the way in which um, retailers have always sort of like um, spoken to the supply chain uh, or collaborated, it's it's been via, on the one hand, EDI, which is very formalized. It, um, it, it sort of um, requires quite a big investment um, and, and it's not very flexible. And on the other hand, you have emails and we all know what happens to emails when people leave the organization. So, so it's really hard to, to, to collaborate. What you're looking for really is something in the middle, which, which sort of is security protected but really allows um, you, you and your supply chain to see the same version of, of, of information, collaboration, you know, collaboration across documents, across um, um, orders, et cetera, in, in the one place, but, but really give you that, that sort of security that you get with that. And I think uh, organizations are, are, are looking more towards that now and, um, you know, maybe moving away a little bit from, from EDI and that sort of thing. I, I think I'll, I'll, that... We Go ahead. So thanks. Thanks, Luca. Um, I think one thing that we also have to realize as part of the end end visibility, the, the question that popped up and the, the COVID kind of disruptions that occurred, uh, I bring up the great toilet paper shortage of 2020, where the to Bill's point, the customer was on social media and hearing that there was a great toilet paper shortage, which made the great toilet paper shortage worse. And was there anything that we could have done as an industry to get ahead of that and somehow tap into any reserves or anything we could do to make sure that there was product on the shelf to alleviate the concern? Um, and, and with the cycle times, I'm not sure that I have an answer on that yet, but it is something I'm thinking about. And how do we make sure that a just-in-time inventory system of upstream from you know, the Walmarts and the Kroger's uh, is flexible enough to be able to handle those surges um, because they will happen. They happened once, they'll happen again. And it, I, I don't have an answer for it yet, but it's something I think that we need to, to consider because we have to make sure you know, uh, we have fr fresh for everyone. Um, you know, in our product chain, so. so. Just to address that part, Brian, because this gives an opportunity to go find out new vendors. 
um, new people who can help out in this process. And um, it's a healthy competition to have during the good times, but it also gives you the fallback mechanism during the bad times when you people come out of woodworks to help you out. I mean, again, a lot of people have capitalized on the COVID situation in terms of, but that's, that's not that, well, that's ethical and unethical, that's not the point here, but people have brought, it's what has sparked is a lot of ideas about how to get out of these situations. So these, the toilet paper issue or the sand, hand sanitizers, and you, they just, people started getting creative at home uh, with ingredients. So I think all, all these will factor in, and it's probably to harness some of these new ideas that we have a good opportunity over when COVID finishes. That is the whole cycle is going to spur uh, and get people ready. How do we harness those things? I would like to go back to the previous point, uh, talking about uh, visibility and uh, EDI. I think EDI has always been that uh, very strong element to put together information, which otherwise they are basically in silo. Uh, but I do believe that uh, most, more often, uh, that EDI conversation has always been left on the side and CVS has been replaced in order to communicate faster if not emails, as, as you were mentioning, Nick. So I would, would like to imagine that in the future, some uh, clear investment are addressed in order to create that collaborative platform. Because the same we were discussing before, you know, we were focusing on the quality of data, but in the end, uh, you know, we, we were actually in a better place by streamlining the process to get data and signal faster for decision making this basically the same exact happen in the back end of the supply chain we have so many parts that are interconnected but they are basically still having walls among themselves and i do agree there is a privacy concern when we're looking at the customer but the same when we're looking at our vendors and our partners and um, until we decide what uh, you know if it's not edi what else it is because it is certainly absolutely need to start having the conversation. If we foresee that in the near future, if we will land on, on anything closer to blockchain, which is a secure network, but we're, we're not even talking about a network today because it's just not on the, in, it's on nobody's agenda. And I think that that actually has to become a priority because before we can go and, and start, you know, working together collaboratively on sustainability, for instance, one very, very important topic at the moment. How can we do that if we have to basically replicate tasks between one entity and the other entity and the other entity again? So we're just not gonna be able to fulfill our North Star, which is you know to become transparent and sustainable. Mm -hmm. It's just not gonna work if technology doesn't support that across the entire chain. I think one of the drivers of, of collaboration um, is, is all about balancing benefits. Um, so, so historically, you know, if you look at EDI and, and other things that went before, it, it was sort of loaded in favor of the retailer to a certain extent was, you know, you, you must follow these guidelines and so on. But I think that I think the, um, uh, the benefits of, of balancing the benefits across the supply chain are, you know, are the way forward and and you know if a supplier has a benefit from from collaboration uh, over and above just receiving the data then then they're all going to take part in that and i i think that was what trey just started off with and and to this day follows is trying to balance the benefits through the supply chain so that so that you know a, a supplier can can sign up and get it free of charge and and a um uh, you know, a customer also gets the benefits as well. Uh, do, do you feel that balancing the benefits is, is, is the way to successful collaboration? Yeah, I think you need to have a win-win uh, for everybody involved. So, you know, we get better data and, and better information on what's available and what we can provide. Uh, our suppliers get better feedback on what we're going to need and what our roadmap looks like for so they can increase their uh, manufacturing capability or warehousing capability. So I, I think that collaboration is definitely how we're <laughs> going to have to go forward. Um, yeah, I agree. I think we have to share agenda. I think uh, today, you know, sustainability, for example, cannot be only one brand uh, 
need. It needs to be for the entire supply chain, the same need. We need to align strategically in what uh, few elements we agree on as a supply chain, because as I believe uh, <clears throat> Christopher uh, Martin was saying, we are competing supply chain against supply chain. And I think that this is exactly where we are at the moment. Uh, the set of steps that are bringing forward product and information, I think this is, a, this is how the new, uh, the, the new competition is evolving. I think that's a very uh, important point, Luca, because, you know, if you think about our two organizations, clearly we're, we're heavily invested in each other. Um, you know, it's not just about um, quality of data. I mean, that's got to be, a, you know, in the future, that's got to be seat at the table um, states. Um, and it's not just about sharing everything with each other. <laughs> I think we've got to be more surgical about understanding, you know, what is important to each other, what our agenda is, what, what questions are we trying to solve for collectively and making sure that we use the data uh, and that we pinpoint, you know, bits of data that can help each other rather than just saying, here, here's, uh, here's everything we've got <laughs> um, and we'll, we'll give it to you uh, and then you, can, then you can go away and figure it out. You know, I think there's a lot more that we can do to say, okay, um, you know, let's try and pinpoint what are the important things there uh, that you can go away and, you know, follow up on or action more. Um, because otherwise it just becomes, you know, you, you can almost get, you can almost drown <laughs> in, in a sea of information. I think, I think the other thing that that highlights for me is not just a, um, between organizations, you know, what are we going to look at and giving everybody access to everything so they can, they can sort of, you know, swim around in it. Um, internally, you know, I think we've got, to, um, we've got a lot of work to do around how people consume the information within the organization. Because, you know, if you work in retail, as I've learned over the last six years with Walmart, um, everybody loves to have you know, sales information, as, as somebody said, you know, the CEO has got the sales information real time. Okay, so what are they going to do with it? Uh, <laughs> and actually, do they need that? Or do they need something that says, you know, in the background, we've used machine learning or, you know, anomaly detection or all those other things that are, you know, now becoming uh, commonplace to identify what the outliers are and what, what the CEO should be worried about <laughs> rather than just saying, here's all the sales data, you can trawl through it um, and you can figure out, you know, what you think the outliers are. Uh, it's taking it to the next step and the step after that that says, okay, so what does that mean? And what are the things that you need to be worried about? And if we're communicating across different organizations, understanding, you know, what's important to each other and what the concerns are so that we can solve problems uh, rather than just exchange, you know, terabytes of information or data. I think that kind of lines up with uh, something that Matteo uh, Bettini said in the chat about, is the implementation benefit worth the cost? You know, and we, we were actually having that conversation yesterday, is the juice worth the squeeze? Um, because a lot of this, there's really good ideas and things that may be good in the future, but the implementation costs are going to take, it's going to take a lot of resources and analysis to get something working. And would it be better to do it now or later? And I think that's a question that we have an obligation to, to ask and push back on when we're given, hey, I want this. Well, why do you want that? What are you going to do with it? But I, I, that's a very good point. And uh, I give you my experience uh, across the past, uh, I don't know, 10 years. And where I've seen that we go through a software implementation and by the time you start brainstorming and you implement at least two years later, if not three, the, the, the requirement has changed. The business has changed. 
And, uh, and it's unfortunate because if we go back to your question, is it worth the squeeze? Well, if you never start, you will never get a better tool to, to facilitate things and, and bring information faster. So it, it, this is a really a big dilemma. That's why to my, our early opening, I think that we need to continue the re-engineer process because uh, the process tend to, con to, to, to be customized as more and more with time because customer demand is getting more fragmented. If we think, think about it for time uh, where he, there was one car, one color, to today's time where basically customers are requesting to customize the offer in the in even where they buy, how they buy it. So in theory, those are all different SKUs. I think that if we continue to imagine the tool that we need to use, it will basically, it's a never ending tool. So I think we need to simplify a little bit that journey, that technology journey and cap that as a 80%, that it's simple enough for us to, um, to, to, to convey information from one end to the other and, and make that seamless. We need to add on top of that, some robotics, some automation or robotics, because what I've learned is that that piece on top, it's so much more easy to be customized. And, and I think that piece, uh, you know, is gonna help us to, to, to bridge that gap between a stable tool on technology, but the customization can never reach that 100%. It needs to stop at 75, 80%. And that last piece, it's either human or robotics that can help and they continue to reiterate depending on the, how the process is changing, how the rule is changing. Because today taxation wants one paper, tomorrow there is another paper. If you go back to the change your ERP, you have work for two months. If you do change your robotics programming, it's probably a 24 or 48 hours effort. And I think we need to be smart in how do we play in, with those different tools in order to really get faster from that perspective, perspective because we don't make money with technology, right? Those are all tools for us to, to collaborate. And on the other side, uh, we need to learn more what the customer needs and what customer wants. And uh, without even turning to our supply, make sure that that product continuously to flow based on what demand. And we definitely will de arrive to the new horizon of you know demand sensing and that the whole thing, how basically it's maybe I say maybe because I'm not there yet, but maybe it's uh, more on real data than historical data. And I think that this is the frontier that we are uh, about to, to, to conquer. It's interesting, Luca, when you, when you talk about cost, uh, yeah, um, I often get asked this, you know, what's the cost of uh, your solution, et cetera. But one of the things that um, organizations don't really think about is what's the cost of doing nothing. And, and we see this in retail all the time. You know, certainly here in the UK, I, I can give you 10 retail organizations that have gone out of business this year. You know, what, what, one of them, you know, it's 150 years old. So, you know, it's not necessarily what is the cost and, you know, how expensive is at the moment. It's what's the cost of doing nothing. Ask Sears. Exactly. But that's, uh, that actually brings up an, another interesting thought process. And, and I'm going to pick on Sears here for a moment down this path because they had a strategy that worked for them for 100 years. And everyone knows that Sears Roebuck catalog back in the day was the go-to. I mean, that was where it was the, it was the Amazon of its time. And they shut that there was a really interesting documentary on YouTube about it on the fall of Sears. And they shut down the catalog business. I want to say it was 1995, um, right at the dawn of the internet age. And they had so much, um, call it, you know, political capital or consumer capital that if they would have thought ahead and, you know, instead of shutting down the catalog, made it an online thing, it culturally, it probably would have led them into, you know, the Amazon of today. Um, but they, they didn't focus on what were their strengths and tried to shift away from them and it cost them their entire empire. So just, yeah, 
it's one of those things to think about, you know, what the long-term ramifications are and think outside the box and be willing to push back um, if what's coming down doesn't make sense. Good point. Brilliant. And um, oh, Bill, were you going to say something? Uh, only to reinforce what Nick said around, you know, and and, and I, I, I kind of wear two hats on this because um, I'm a finance guy. I'm also a supply chain analytics guy, and uh, you know, you're constant. We're constantly saying to people, "Well, you've got to bring the business case here." <laughs> that it's sometimes difficult to quantify what the cost of doing nothing is and or not going on the journey. Um, so, you know, I think, uh, um, I think that, that sometimes becomes very difficult for an organization because, you know, when it comes to technology and uh, product and, you know, uh, there, there's, there's a lot of things that you can do out there as an organization, and there's probably more on the list than um, everybody's got the financial resources or the human capital to undertake as quickly as they want. So I think you've got to be choiceful around how you prioritize things and what you prioritize. And then once you've decided what it is you're going to do, I think there's a big challenge now around figuring out how you're going to go faster. Okay, so, you know, as, as I think about all of this, um, and we've talked about, you know, and I agree with Luca, you know, I've been in organizations where it seems to take years and years to get stuff done. I think you have to figure out, okay, well, how can we go faster and get things done a lot quicker these days? And, you know, there's, there's an interesting analogy out there at the moment. Uh, if you think about the last 12 months and you think about uh, the development of the vaccines for COVID-19, um, you know, there's companies out there that figured out how to do something that normally takes 10 years and the fastest it's ever been done is four years and they got it done in 10 months. So, you know, I think uh, there's a challenge when it comes to technology and implementation here around how do you how do you take a cycle that took years in the past and get it done an awful lot quicker? Well, I think in this in the the COVID case and that rapid delivery cycle that we had to do, um, I think we really were able to look ac across the project and say what what's a what truly is the minimum viable product what can we cut out of it the movie gung ho with michael keaton comes to mind where you know okay we got to start leaving out little things like engines you know and, and how do they deliver a product that that met the minimum requirement which in their case was something that could be counted as a car um but you know there's going to be architectural debt that was incurred as part of this cycle that we're going to have to take time and go back and make sure that it is a hardened solution and it will work outside of what we've currently got. Because I think we cut a lot, and I'm saying this industry-wide, I think that as we tried to react to what was a black swan event, um, you know, we did the minimum that we could to get the, you know, keep, keep the lights on in some cases and make sure the shelves were full but is it sustainable? Is it something that really lines up with the way we want to go going forward? Or was it a duct tape and band-aid kind of scenario? So um, I really want to ask some of these questions. I think I had one from ages ago <laughs> stuck with me and then also the most recent one. Um, there was a, a pattern here. I think I wrote it down about 20 times, which was, collaboration and partnerships and how do we make that work? That was a point that came across a lot. Um, and one of the questions was about interoperability and data standardization and what your thoughts were around that and the implementation of that. Um, if anyone has anything. I, I'm an escape data architect. So knowing what your data model looks like is extremely important. Um, understanding it, being able to have a glossary and be able to use it, that speeds up your uh, 
your development efforts. So if we can use industry standards instead of having a business standard, you know, so this is something that this is the way Kroger does it, or this is the way Walmart does it. We should be doing it. This is the standard that this standards body has put out and we reuse it so that when we do want to interoperate, then everybody's already running off the same playbook. Um, that is of critical importance and, you know, projects live or die by how good their data is. So industry standards are a plus. I, yeah, I totally agree, Brian. And, um, you know, one of the standards that we, we deal with um, in trade shift is like e-invoicing standards and stuff like that. And, and we're seeing now that, you know, with, with Pep Hall and, and sort of uh, regimes like that, that, that there is standardization. And, and you're right, there, there's, there's sort of savings to be made by everybody uh, following the, the same standards because you don't have to reinvent it. And, you know, half, half the cost is on the reinvention of these things. And, uh, you know, we, we certainly don't, for those of you who remember, we don't want to be into a Betamax VHS sort of argument. What we want to do is be using uh, standards that are totally interoperable, uh, you know, uh, amongst organizations. And certainly from a tracial perspective, that's what we try to do with our network is to make it as accessible as possible without having to reinvent the wheel really. Yeah, and if I remember correctly, Betamax was the better technology Correct. The VHS opened themselves up and didn't have the closed environment that Betamax did. So, well, I guess VHS is still dead today, but you know. <laughs> and then we go into streaming and it all changes again. Yep. So another interesting point is here, and a lot of people are mentioning in the comments tools for data sharing. So what does, what does cloud do? There's what mentioning of blockchain as well. Um, what are some of the things that we can use? Are these solutions like cloud and blockchain viable to, to be able to kind of overcome that data sharing um, conundrum that you all have? Um, I'll take that. Uh, blockchain, I mean, we're talking almost, um, from you know, skipping the crawl walk stage and trying to run. Uh, and I think the industry as a whole will get there. Are we there? No. But um, when you start doing blockchain or data sharing, the people are not used to these security standards. Um, name it uh, our B2B partners or your suppliers, whatever it is, right? They, they don't they are still finding their way through it. Putting these things will only slow down the progress you're trying to implement um, and the technology you're trying to implement. You just don't want to be too far ahead where you don't have people to go along, whether it's within your organization or outside. Um, but it's a great concept. I know eventually that should be the, um, where we all should go. Blockchain should be the way to, for people to move and transfer data. But I think the industry as a whole is not ready for that yet, in in my limited view. I think just to pick up on that point, um, you know, you've got to be thoughtful around what is the problem that you're trying to solve. So blockchain might be great for, you know, and I can think of examples within Walmart's supply chain where um, it's got a, uh, a role to play and it's very useful, but saying blockchain is the answer to everything um, is not going to get us to where we need to get to. Um, you know, we've got to think through, okay, what is the use case? What is the specific problem that we're going to, that we're, we're trying to solve here? And then what are the right tools that are out there? uh to solve the problem so you know i think i come back to um you can have an awful lot of data <laughs> and you can have a lot of tools and you can have a lot of solutions it's uh it's like being a surgeon what's the right combination and what are the right um solutions that you're going to leverage to solve that particular problem and that particular use case and so, you know, what you're going to need to understand is what are, 
what are the benefits? Um, what can everything do for you? And I think it does then start to demand, okay, well, um, what is out there? Um, and what is the universe of solutions? But uh, I think you have to be more uh, customized around the problem, the specific problem that you're trying to solve to get the best outcome. I, I would see, I would imagine this conversation going in the direction where we put in the middle uh, live, live uh, data, uh, which means that uh, an abundancy of live data. I would believe that in the future, basically we will be need to run the business with abundancy of data, because at the end we're gonna use, uh, we're gonna use mathematical tools, the machine learning, or to basically cluster them, derive data point that we can use and uh, implement those data point, which are basically very selected data point, they're not the live one anymore. And they are uh, used at certain milestone and gateway when we develop, when we innovate, when we deliver to customer and so on and so forth. And they will help us improve processes along the way. I would imagine that this is the vision, uh, how in the next three, to five years since it's gonna develop. Can I see, can I say that right now we have a tool to keep that safe? We call it blockchain because it's the only word that it was available and everybody uh, can put these two images together. But in reality, I have not seen a tool that can do all of that uh, safe and with speed and with a, with, a, with, a, with an accessible cost for enterprise to do that shift. In my opinion, it's almost like if we want to type, we only want using one finger. So that's how it feels. Uh, and again, I'm not an expert on blockchain, but this is my feeling as somebody that would be interested in, but the tools that I uh, see at the moment available are not yet developed to, for, to, to sustain a large scale of integration. Because if we think about it, only our backend supply chain, there are at least four tiers. And if every level has, I don't know, 10 players, you do the math and it's clear to understand that integration of uh, 40, 50 players is just not going to work. So I would say that uh, the potential is uh, incredible. Uh, technology really has, has to um, do a vertical development, almost like in 1995 when Window brought to market a, a software that needed R RAM, RAM price just dropped because it was so necessary that technology did that leap forward. So what I'm thinking is we are at that stepping stone where things have to change in order for us to really get full access on what the potential is. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that, Luca. And um, certainly when I, when I was going out speaking to um, organizations maybe five years ago, it, you know, they were afraid of cloud. Um, yeah, networks weren't strong enough, etc. Now, pretty much, um, Bill, you said that at the beginning, uh, Walmart, everybody uses cloud, right? Um, and everybody tends to use multi-tenant as well. And, and certainly that, that is the way things are going and blockchain will come in in, in whatever form it is, but, but certainly that the security will be tightened up so that, so that you have you, or you know who changes the record and, and when it happens and, and so on. So that is definitely going to happen. And, and I think, you know, that that's certainly the way forward. Right. And so we've got, well, we had, I thought we had two minutes, got about one minute left. Um, and I usually get some final thoughts from everyone, but I think, and what I'd like to ask as a final question from everyone is, is around that decision-making process and how were you able to make a decision based on all of these data that you had or didn't have? Did you have to do gut feeling decisions? Um, did you manage to, to kind of have that actionable insights proven from data? Um, and I know it's um, probably a wide question, but um, <laughs> maybe we can fit it, squeeze it in one minute. You wanna start me? Okay. Yep, yeah, uh, sir, I mean, again, lot will start with expertise. You mean, call it gut or expertise that go along with it. You want to start the use cases with where the problem areas are, what the pain points are, and what people think are the right ways to do. You That is the starting point. You just can't come out of the woodworks and think of something that, um, that is, so you, you want to have that. Then you are 
build around that holes. What are the things that, from a data standpoint, from a technology standpoint, from a process standpoint, how are these things going to help build that case? You take one, that one doesn't need to be the, that one use case you, do, you take is doesn't need to be the biggest one. You probably want a smaller one that you can show the value and the impact quicker. And then use that as a stepping stone for future success. That's Um, let me let me summarize my thoughts. I I would say I am extremely excited about where we are uh, when it comes to the world of data. I don't think there's ever been a more exciting time um, in terms of tools, techniques, um, the opportunity that's out there to leverage um, data and, and really get to more fact-based solutions. Um, I saw somebody talk about gut feel, you know, I think uh, there's no reason why we can't all accelerate our journey towards, you know, scientifically driven and fact based solutions. And uh, uh, this is a great time uh, to, to sort of be involved in that. I do think, uh, and there's a couple of people in the chat room that have talked about this, uh, change management is going to be a huge deal in all of this. So it's gonna require a lot of people in every organization to change the way that they consume data, what's important to them, how they do it, and uh, how they make the most of it. Perfect. Um, so we'll probably, we reach the end now and there's, there's quite a few questions here. And so maybe I'll try and, and send some over to you and we can, we can answer them at a later time. Um, but thank you so much, everyone that, you know, asked uh, questions and of course the panelists I joined today. Um, and having said that, um, have a good day. Thank you all. Um, and hopefully we'll do another one in a year's time and we'll see where we, <laughs> where we are. Um, all right, well, thanks everyone. Um, and goodbye. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Thanks. Thanks, everyone.